glad you could be with us for worship today. I'm Pastor Kurt Lemko, coming to you for Christ Lutheran Church in Rochester. Today we're thinking about the question that the enemies of Jesus used to try to make him look bad. But Jesus turns it around to show them their own hypocrisy. With that, I think we're ready to begin our worship. So we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 91, paraphrase. The Lord cares for his own and delivers him even in the midst of the conflicts that plague him. That one whose faith is in God, who finds security in him, does not have to live in fear. He is not unaffected by the tempests of this life, but he may be wounded by the strength of evil, but his great God does not leave him to suffer these things alone. The Lord cares for him who is his own and delivers him even in the midst of the conflicts that plague him. So far the song. Our first New Testament reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So ends the reading from 1 Thessalonians. The Gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 22, beginning at the 15th verse. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right? to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So ends the reading of the Gospel. Having heard God's words to us, we give our words of faith to him with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is the Gospel lesson which has been read, the question of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Often in debates, in debates you hear people say, I want a yes or no answer, right? There's no room for explanation, it's either yes or no. It reminds me of the first Bible class I taught at a new church once, and one of the people said, you believe that Adam was a representative person? And I said yes, and just moved on. Little did I know that this was a political question, and if you said Adam was a representative person, it meant that you didn't believe he was a real person. My reply should have been from Romans, where Paul says, As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall we all made alive. And so he's a representative person because he's real and represents a whole group of people. And Jesus is a real person and represents a whole group of his believers. And so sometimes you don't know when you're being set up. Jesus knew. Sometimes it's not a question, but just something that strikes you a little odd. One of my boys went out to his friend who lived on a farm. So it happened that it was the evening they would have fried chicken. And so they killed the chicken and uh, they fried up the chicken and they had chicken. And the next day, our boy came back and he said, Mom, out at Chad's they eat their animals. Isn't that odd? Well, the question was, isn't it odd? And it really wasn't so odd, but Having never seen it before, it seemed a little odd. But in the text, we have another kind of question. It would be called a gotcha question, right? It is a question about loyalty. The enemies of Jesus knew that if you said you should pay taxes, that might be interpreted as supporting the hated Romans. And if you said no, then they had the Herodians there who would give him static and possibly take him into custody. And so the people who did this were the Pharisees, first of all. They were the good church people. They were the people who did everything right, but they expected you to toe the line. On the other hand, the Herodians, you can see the word Herod in their name of their group. The Herodians were those who kind of just went along with the Roman occupation and did whatever it took to get along. And they were there to see whether he would express his loyalty to the forces of Rome. And so either way, it seemed like Jesus would be in trouble, either with the people or with the governing authorities. But Jesus saw right through their questioning, and uh, <clears throat> he said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me with your words? Now, Jesus had been doing his ministry, moving day by day toward his destiny on the cross. And in the meantime, he was teaching and healing as he went along and growing in popularity with the people. And so the Pharisees thought they were kind of losing their hold on the people. On the other hand, the Herodians didn't feel much support from him either. This isn't the first time that the enemies of Jesus tried to trap him with words. There are a couple other instances where the Sadducees, these were people who didn't believe in a resurrection, asked him the question about those who would marry their brother's wife after a brother had passed away. See, the Old Testament said that if 
a couple was married, they had no children, <clears throat> then um, if the husband died, then his brother should marry the widow and have children for his brother. And so they asked the question, if a man married his brother's wife after he died, and then he died, and there were seven brothers, and it went all the way down to the seventh brother. I think actually if it was me, I'd be saying, what happened? Was there something going on? Because after the third one died, I'd wonder why they were all dying. In any case, the idea was, in the resurrection, they'd have to be sorting out whose wife that really was. But Jesus had an answer. He said, it's not like that. It's not like earth in the presence of God in the afterlife. And that took care of that. And then there was another one where a lawyer was asking the question, what is the great commandment? And there was controversy about that. But Jesus said, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so he didn't go to the strict answer of one commandment. He added the business about loving your neighbor as well. And so in each case, Jesus had a different answer to the question than was expected by the people who asked the question. Today we think of the question given to Jesus by the Pharisees and the Herodians, who incidentally usually didn't do much cooperating, but they had a common enemy, that was Jesus. And so they were going out together to try to trap him in his words. And they asked, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Basically. And Jesus said, you know, he'd say, show me the money, right? <laughs> And so they brought out a denarius, and here was the picture of Caesar with an inscription as well. Now, technically, this was against the commandment not to make any graven images. And so the Pharisees normally would say, you know, this is just not kosher. You shouldn't do that. But Jesus said, it's different. There are two realms. This is the basis that we use as Lutherans for the two kingdoms idea. There is the kingdom of the right hand, they call it, and this is the spiritual kingdom, that idea that we give our lives to Jesus as our king, and then we are subject to him, and the kingdom of the left hand, they call it, which is our normal civil government. And that's why he says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And so that amazed them. They didn't know what to say because they recognized their own hypocrisy as Jesus actually showed the picture of Caesar that said to the Pharisees, you know, you use that money even though technically that's something you shouldn't be doing. And to the Herodians, he said, go ahead and pay the tax. So they couldn't touch him either. And he showed that they were simply trying to trap him. And that was that. So that was the answer. It was something which wasn't obvious. And it wasn't really the answer they were looking for. They were looking for a yes or a no, right? But there are a few questions that can be answered, just yes or no. And Jesus gave the full answer. We have responsibility to our government. We also have responsibility to our God. So, in effect, he was telling the Pharisees too, is this all that piety means to you? Can you be bought off <coughs> just by this idea? of paying taxes or not. And that showed another thing about the shallowness of their dedication to God. The things that are God's, that's the problem, right? He said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. What 
are the things that belong to God. Well, that touches our own spirit, our inner life. You might say that at baptism, he put his image on ourselves, our spirits, our totality of humanness. Jesus expresses it in various ways, you know, when he says, love the Lord your God with all that you have, basically. And Paul expresses that same thing in Philippians chapter 2. He says you should have the same attitude that Jesus has. And that kind of brings us to another idea, and that is the idea of suffering. Jesus was suffering as he went through his ministry. He was attacked by enemies, and he knew that finally he would be going to the cross. So that makes it a little more difficult for people to say, yes, I will follow him, because following him may mean we also suffer. Jesus was willing to do that, and his people are often willing to do that as well. When there is a choice, they choose that which belongs to God and let the pieces fall wherever they may. Jesus went to the cross, and with his life, death, and resurrection, he showed us a way to dedicate ourselves to God. But one thing that is missing, that the disciples seemed to ignore, was the resurrection. There's one person who wrote a book called Finding God in the Questions. His name is Timothy Johnson. He used to be a commentator for the medical part of reports on ABC News a few years ago. Then he became a pastor as well. But he said that suffering in the world is a challenge to many people because the formulation goes like this. If God is loving and God is all-powerful, why is there so much suffering in the world? Okay, and his idea, which was not really well developed, he said, I'm still working on that, is that <clears throat> it points to the future. It points to resurrection. It points to a new kind of situation where all things will finally be rectified. And that was part of the idea of the death of Jesus too, that his death made things right with God. You might say that his death is a substitute for ours and it was a way to overcome that final death that we have. And so that will be one answer, I guess, for the problem of pain, the problem of suffering. It's still something that we struggle with and yet Jesus did it and the final idea was not death, but life, resurrection life, life that can no longer be touched by death. And so we follow with the confidence that no matter what happens in this life, painful or full of kinds of uh, difficulties, finally God has the last word, the word of life. Amen. Shall we pray? Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful to live in this land where we can support our nation without having to deny our faith. We thank you for the people of this country who carry on with essential work in spite of the coronavirus pandemic. We ask for your protection, both for them and for us. Guide those who work to eliminate the crisis and help us to return to normal as soon as possible. Enable our scientists to discover new secrets and to use this knowledge for the common good. Be with those with special health challenges, especially Ken Schmidt, who is recovering from open heart surgery, and Sharon Chinow, who moved to a nursing home after being 
hospitalized with problems which are still puzzling the doctors. Give insight to the doctors and strength to the spouses and all who give support to those who are ill. Today, we also pray for those who are in authority. Fill our leaders with a true dedication to justice and freedom. Help us to advance equal justice and opportunity for all and to care for the hungry and the poor. Give us your spirit to guide us as we take care of our obligations to the government and most of all, our dedication to you. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.